Welcome to ECE 165. This is the second lecture on the topic of arithmetic building blocks. Now the reason that we have a second lecture on this topic is A, we didn't cover all of the material uh, that we wanted to cover in arithmetic building blocks in the previous lecture. And perhaps the more important reason why we're doing this is I recognize that the previous lecture was probably rather confusing for many of you. Um, so what I'd like to do with the first part of this lecture is go over the material again, perhaps try and look at it at a slightly different perspective, explain it slightly differently to try and make sure that everybody understands it. Again, these are rather confusing topics. Uh, there's a lot of nomenclature that's being thrown around here. So it is important that you spend a little bit of time thinking about this, reading about it, and to make sure that you understand it, uh, and which is the, the reason why we're doing this additional lecture. Uh, now, I do highly recommend the textbook, uh, reading the sections about this in the textbook. It, they are rather well described in the textbook as well. So please do use that as a resource. So let's go ahead and get started. And first, I just want to very briefly review some of the uh, items from last class. So in the last lecture, we discussed how we build a full adder, a full one-bit adder. Uh, and the, these are based on some basic Boolean uh, building blocks where the output carry, C out, is equal to A and B, or C in and A or B. Whereas the sum at the output is the exclusive or of A, B, exclusive or with C, which we could simplify in the following manner. It's equal to A, B, C, or C out bar, and A or B or C, where C is, is just represents C in, in this particular case. Now we ended up liking that uh, embodiment of the sum calculation simply because it includes the C out. And so basically we could reuse the block that's computing C out, invert it, and then use it in our sum calculation because C out is on the critical path and sum is not. This was an appropriate way to reuse some hardware. So we also looked into what these Boolean expressions look like. It turns out that they are symmetric functions and therefore we could employ a mirrored topology where both the pull up net network and the pull down network are the same. Um, this is not something we can conventionally do, but because we have this uh, symmetric property, it turns out that it's okay. So in the last class, we also introduced this, this frankly rather weird terminology of generate, propagate, and kill. Um, and of course, I mentioned that's the name of my new band, so I asterisk that, and please don't steal that. Um, but anyways, you know, we introduced this nomenclature and for many of you, it may not have been entirely clear why the heck we were doing this. It seemed to be throwing more complexity at an already difficult to understand problem. So it turns out there's, it, there is a good reason why we do this, right? Uh, so we create these generate and propagate signals to eventually help us create adders that are much faster than they otherwise could be. So they are very important to, to, to implement. So let's take a moment just to review what we mean by these uh, various, uh, by this nomenclature. So first, generate. If generate is one, that implies that there will be a carry out no matter what the carry in is. Okay, so we decided that this only happens if both A and B are equal to one. This way we know there's a carry out regardless of what that carry in is. The next a term that we use is called propagate. If propagate is one, this implies that if there's a carry in, uh, it will go through to the output. And we decided that this happens when either one of A or B, uh, sorry, that should be B, let me erase that and provide a better B, are equal to one. Okay, so we said either A or B are equal to one, but not both at the same time. If both at the, at the, are true at the same time, then if carry in is zero, then carry out will be one, which means we've generated, but we haven't propagated the carry. Okay, so that's the key difference here. And then finally, we said uh, we could have a kill situation, which if kill is equal to one, that implies that the carry out is, is killed. Um, and this only happens if both A and B are both equal to zero. So K is equal to A bar, B bar. It turns out we don't use the kill nomenclature all that often, but, uh, um, but you know, it is something useful to keep around in our repertoire just in case. So then we kind of factored these generate and propagate expressions into larger groups of generates and propagates. 
So we said that generate for say bit i through j uh, is equal to generate of bits i through k uh, or propagate i through k and generate of k minus one through j. Okay, and the, these uh, boxes should be uh, the and symbol. PowerPoint's just messing them up. Okay, uh, and we can kind of go through a similar explanation for the propagate case. Uh, we have uh, the definitions for the base case, and then we can compute the sum effectively by doing an XOR between the uh, bitwise propagate signal and the group generate signal to zero. So these equations do sum up exactly what we're trying to implement, but if you just look at them, it's hard to figure out what's I, J, K, you know, we have some alphabet soup going on here. So I feel like the easiest way to do this is to go through an example. So in this example, we are building a ripple carry adder. Okay, so what we mean by that is this is exactly the same adder as before, except instead, instead of building it using full adders, we're building it with uh, generate and propagate signals. Okay, so the steps to create this, this circuit are as follows. First, we compute, generate, and propagate for each pair of inputs. Uh, in other words, this is creating, computing generate uh, i through i for bit i, um, you know, ai and vi. Okay, and then what we do is we recursively combine the generates and propagates to determine the group generates. All right. Um, now, how we do this in a more advanced adder changes, but for a simple ripple carry adder, it's strictly a recursive definition. Okay, so what we say is that generate zero is just that we just define that to be the carry in. Okay, so, so if there's a carry in, then the previous stage that generated that carry in generated, and therefore G zero is equal to C in. So we say that there's a generate at the output of the first stage of our adder if uh, the first A and B generate, right? So if both A and B are equal to one, then we know there's gonna be carry out at the output no matter what. Or if generate one is not true, but propagate one is, and we had a carry in, or in other words, G zero through zero is equal to one, then we know that um, G one through zero will indeed generate. Okay, so now we can recursively add this definition. Uh, so I just, uh, just for sake, I just described this line here. So now let me describe this line here. So we say that the second stage of the adder will generate if bits A and B of that second stage generate, so that's G two, or if the bits A and B propagate and the carry in into that stage happens to be logic one, or in other words, generate one through zero is equal to one. Now we happen to have the definition of G one through zero. It's just written up here. Okay, so we can go ahead and insert that, um, which is given by this expression here. All right, so again, now we can go to the next line. This is where this recursive definition starts to happen, where we say that the generate of the third stage will be equal to one if A3 and B3 are both equal to one, or in other words, G3 is equal to one, or if A3 and B3 propagate and the carry into the previous stage is equal to one, or in other words, G2 through zero is equal to one. Well, we have a definition for G2 through zero that's just you know shown up here. So this is where this recursive definition comes into play and so, so on and so forth. Okay, so what we're doing is is computing g x or i through zero, I guess, uh, for each bit i in the adder, and recursively applying this definition. Now, once we have all of these generates, we can then compute the sum as the XOR between the propagate of that of the bitwise propagate and the prior stages group prop, uh, group generate signal. So this approach is effectively summarized in this uh, schematic diagram here. Step one is where we compute all of the bitwise uh, generates and propagates. That's exactly the same step as, as we showed before. Step two, which is actually not shown on this slide, is where we compute the group propagate generate logic. 
Uh, this is that recursive definition that we described on the previous slide. Then once we have this recursive definition, then step three is effectively to XOR uh, the result of that group generate with the bitwise propagate in order to create these sum outputs. Okay, so we can now go ahead and pictorially represent what this step two group generate and propagate logic looks like. And it's just this recursive definition. It's, a, it's an AND between the bitwise propagate signal. Okay, so we could uh, maybe annotate on here. This is between the bitwise propagate signal that gets ANDed with the generate signal from the previous stage. Okay, so that creates this term right here. All right, and then we OR that. We have an OR gate over here with the bitwise generate signal from, from this stage, and, and this is basically representing this piece of the function over here, okay? And we just kind of continue doing this uh, through the, the rest of the circuit. So we call this a recursive chain of and ors. Okay, um, and so if you if you build the adder in this way, you've effectively built a ripple carry adder. And what we mean by that is the carry that comes in CN has to ripple through this this collection of and or gates in order in order to make it through to the output. So this is why we call it a ripple carry adder. This is also why it happens to be a rather slow adder, particularly as the number of bits starts to increase. So in order to increase the speed of adders, we introduce this PG diagram. Um, and specifically within this PG diagram, we have a few different cells that we're looking to build. There's what we call a gray cell, which creates only a generator, just a generate signal. Uh, and this is a, a single bit generate signal. Uh, and it's basically just an and or, and or structure. Okay, and then we have these black cells, which creates a generate signal and a propagate signal. Okay, so we have the and or, and then an additional and in order to create this groupwise propagate signal. And then we have these buffer cells that are just, you know, strictly buffers. So we can go ahead and describe the delay of a ripple carry adder or a carry ripple adder, depending on what you want to call it, through what we call a PG diagram, where we have delay on the y-axis and bit position on effectively the x-axis, uh, where this uh, bit zero here is basically being treated as the origin. Okay. Uh, so what we said here is that we have a delay through the generate and propagate logic, TPG. We have a delay through the XORs to compute the sums at the bottom here. And each one of these gray cells it has the delay, it, these are and or cells, has an and or delay, okay? So we say that the worst case delay through an adder constructed in this mechanism, this is a normal ripple carry adder, it goes through the PG logic, it goes through all these and or cells, and then finally through the XOR at the bottom. So we say that the delay here is TPG plus N minus one, times and the and or delay plus the delay of the XOR circuits. Okay, so we say that this is the worst case delay through our adder structure. So it turns out that there's also a way that we can build higher valency cells. Okay, and so basically what, what this does is it computes group generates in parallel. Uh, so for example, a group generates if the MSB generates or if MSB minus one generates, and I'll just abbreviate by gens, and the MSB 
propagates. Or if MSB minus two generates and MSB minus one and MSB minus two propagate, etc. Okay, so effectively what this means is this is a, a basically the, the recursive definition that we've seen before, except now it's implemented, implement as a single stage of logic. Okay, um, at which point it might possibly be faster. So I will put a little ask, uh, a star here that says careful about fan in. Okay, and what, what we mean by that is, as we found out in our lectures on logical effort, it's usually not good to have too large of a stage effort, right? So we don't wanna have gates with too large number of inputs, otherwise they start to slow down from a logical effort perspective. Okay, so we could build these massive higher valency cells with tons of inputs computing things across a very large number of inputs. But if we do so, that individual gate might be a little slow. Okay, so depending on the technology and, and how you design your logic and so on, according to logical efforts structures, we do wanna be careful about fan in and we probably don't want more than four inputs or so. Um, you know, that's a rough rule of thumb. Uh, based on the class sizing convention, actually. Uh, but I think that's a reasonable uh, thing to say. Okay, so just be careful when you're building higher valency cells. So with those definitions and so on out of the way, uh, the first thing we looked at in, in the last class from a adder architecture perspective is what's called the carry skip adder, or sometimes called the carry bypass adder. Okay, and so the idea here is the following. First, what we wanna do is we wanna compute the bitwise propagate and generate signals for all of our adders, okay? Or for all of our uh, bitwise input pairs. Okay, so let's create those. Uh, they are each fed by data um, A0, B0, A1, B1, and so on, A2, B2, a3, B3, okay. Um, so I, I guess I should preface this by saying this is one approach. Uh, this, this is actually the ripple carry approach that, that I'm describing here, okay. So now once we've computed all of these bitwise propagate and generate signals, and just to be extra clear here, this is gonna create G0 and P0, G1, P1 and so on, G2, P2, P3, and G3. Now, once we've created these bitwise generate and propagate signals, then all we basically need below here is an and or cell um, to create our um, carry out and an XOR cell in order to create the sum. Okay, so what we say here is that we have CN coming over here. This creates sum zero. And then this will go into our next cell, which has an and or and an XOR cell. And we get this signal here, which is basically ultimately the, the carry out of that first stage. Um, and I suppose I should have drawn my box to be up here. Okay. So the rest of that adder structure basically looks looks like that, right? So we have our outputs here. This is our carry out. This is sum three, sum two, and sum one. So again, this is if we had done this in the basic ripple carry structure. All right, and let's just add a little bit of annotation here. So what we're doing here is we're computing P and G for all bits 
in parallel at once, in case parallel was not clear. Okay, so we're computing all of the bitwise generate and propagate signals in parallel at once. All right, so the idea here, the idea with this concept is to say if propagate 3 to 0 is equal to 1, or i.e. what we mean by that is if P3 and P2 and P1 and P0 are all equal to 1, then the idea is C in will propagate directly to C out. We know this for sure based on the definition of our propagate signals here. Okay, so the idea is let's pre-compute let's pre-compute P3 through 0 to speed things up. Okay, so if we can pre-compute P3 to 0, we can pre-identify if this scenario is going to happen. And if this scenario is going to happen, maybe there's a way that we can speed things up. So if I could just write down this idea here. So the idea is you're, you're computing these bitwise propagate and generate signals, as we showed earlier. And I'm not going to show all of the inputs and so on, just to save a little bit of time here. So we're computing all of these guys. And then we go into these and, or, and XOR structures. As follows. And, or, and XOR. Okay. So these signals are coming down over here. That's the CN. So the idea here is why don't we just go ahead and pre-compute all of these propagate signals? Okay, let's add them all together. One, two, three, plus four. So that's computing P3 through zero. Okay, so we say that if P3 three through zero is one, then we know that the carry in will simply propagate all the way through to the carry out. So we don't have to bother waiting for the ripple to happen here. All right, so what we can do is we can use the output of this structure as the input into a multiplexer, which I guess I'll draw here in black for clarity. Okay, so nominally, this signal just goes right through to the output and we'll call this C uh, out comma three. All right, so if P33, three through zero is equal to zero, then we know we just have to ripple in the normal way. However, if we know that P3 through zero is equal to one, then what we can do is we can just take CN, push it right over here and propagate it right through to the output. Okay, so we say that if P3 through zero is equal to one, then the carry in quote unquote skips directly to C out three, saving time uh, because you don't have to wait for all these ripples uh, for the next stage of logic that this may be connected to. Okay. So this is a very good way to possibly save actually quite a bit of time uh, in our adder structures. So now the, the next question we may ask ourselves is, well, what is the worst case input vectors that result in the worst case delay? So it turns out that the worst case is now when P0 is equal to zero and P1, P2, and P3 are all equal to one, okay? So in this case, we don't have stage one propagating. 
but the rest of the stages do. Okay, so what that means is if there is a carry that gets generated uh, in stage one, say through a, a generate term, then it has to propagate through the andors and we and, and, and we can't skip it. All right, so this is now the worst case delay for this type of adder. So normally what we do with a carry skip adder is we don't skip over the entire adder, uh, uh, you know, that's especially for a large bit adder, that makes the worst case now the point, the, the, the case where the ripple has to carry or ripple through all of the stages except the first one, okay, which is not that good of a savings. So what we typically like to do is create uh, small groups, okay? So we motivate this by saying the, the ripple carry is just a little too slow if we have it pass through all of the stages. So what we prefer to do is skip over groups of smaller number of bits. Okay, so in this particular example, we've, we're building a 16-bit adder, uh, and we've grouped it into bits of groups of four, uh, where we can skip over uh, four bits at a time. Okay, so it turns out now that the critical path is when we have to go through this first adder, and as I said earlier, that uh, the last three propagates are one, but propagate zero was equal to zero. So we actually had to had to ripple through the adder. We couldn't just skip it. Skipping it is actually faster, uh, and therefore is no longer on the worst case path. Okay, but it turns out something really interesting happens. Okay, once we've rippled through that first stage, it turns out the remainder of the critical path actually goes through these muxes before actually finally having to go through the, the final uh, ripple um, carry portion down here, okay? So that's a little bit counterintuitive, perhaps. You would think that the worst case would be when it ripples through everything, but it turns out that's the advantage of the carry skip adder is that we don't have to wait to ripple through everything, okay? So let's perhaps discuss this on the carry skip PG diagram in the next slide. So here's that carry skip uh, PG diagram, and just to be extra clear, this is the, the time delay for generating the PG signal, remembering that delay is represented on the y-axis here. Um, these guys here are the uh, delays of the and ors. Same thing for blue. We now have the delay of a mux in play here. Um, just to be extra clear, um, this is the delay of an and or as well, T A or, okay. And then finally at the end, we have to compute the X or, okay. So the critical path in this scenario now is as follows. As I mentioned, we have to ripple through these first stages. Uh, we of course have to go through the mux. But now what is the remainder of the critical path? Uh, it turns out this is quite interesting. All right, so if the propagate of the next stage is zero, then the carry out or carry uh, C in four, if you will here, does not propagate to the output, okay? So if any one of the propagate signals from bits uh, four through eight, uh, or rather, I guess, um, yeah, four through seven, I suppose I should say, are zero, if any one of those are zero, then we know we don't have a propagate all the way through to the output, okay? If that's the case, then we've already pre-computed what the output should be, right? We did this at the start, um, if I could briefly highlight, using these guys, right? So they're already pre-computed, their outputs are already ready to go, okay? So the worst case now is when all of those do have to propagate, when, when CN4 has to propagate all the way out to C out seven, okay? If that's the case, then, hey, we know we already have pre-computed that propagate condition. We can just skip right on through through that mux in order to get through that bit width, okay? We can do the same thing for the next stage. And then finally, when we get to the last stage, well, um, we, we ultimately do end up having to go through these, um, uh, last through and or structures. So this is now the critical path here, okay? So again, that's that's a little bit confusing, 
Um, but the worst case is now when P7 through 4 and P8 through 11 are both equal to 1, which means that we indeed propagate through those stages. Uh, simply because if, that's, if that condition is not true, then we've already computed the right answers in parallel with that first stage uh, while we were waiting for the propagation of the first stage and we no longer have to wait for them. Okay, so again, that explanation might be a little bit confusing. I've tried to explain it slightly differently than I did in the prior lecture. If you need more explanation, I do strongly suggest that you read uh, either one of those textbooks. They do describe this rather well. Now again, just for um, uh, clarity's sake, if we had a normal ripple caryatter, then the critical path would you know, be going down something like this. So this is T crit for a normal ripple carry adder. So you can clearly see that, that this uh, carry skip is a much more efficient uh, use of time here. So we say that the, uh, uh, the critical path delay for the carry skip adder is equal to the PG delay for all that logic plus two times n minus one times the and or. That's because we have to do the and ors for the first group of bits and the second group of bits plus k minus one times the multiplexer delay, which is new, plus the XOR delay. Okay, uh, I should specify that for capital N number of bits, uh, we've, we've broken that up into k groups of N bits each for this particular calculation. So it turns out that for a large number of bits uh, represented by capital N, we get a distinct benefit from employing the carry skip adder architecture. Okay, um, so it turns out that it's still order n, which means we get we still get a linear increase in the propagation delay as the number of bits increases linearly, but at least it's a shallower slope than for the normal ripple carry adder. However, you will note here that um, for small number of bits, the overhead of adding the mux and, and doing the extra computation needed for a carry skip adder turns out to not be worth it. So if you have a very small number of bits that you're adding, that's eh, probably not worth doing a carry skip adder. You're probably going to be better off just doing a normal ripple carry adder. But in digital design, we don't typically implement very low number of bit adders very often. Uh, and so it's usually wins to build a carry skip kind of adder. So now that we better understand how to design a carry skip adder, we can now go ahead and start to basically make it more complicated and do more computation within the adder to help further speed up the uh, speed of uh, com uh, computing the uh, results here. Okay, so the first class of adders that we'll, we'll br very briefly in this lecture anyways investigate is something called a carry lookahead adder. Uh, and so what this does is it computes the groupwise generates, um, and I suppose I should say and propagates for many bits in parallel. All right, um, and how it does this is effectively it uses a higher valency cell with more than two inputs each. All right, so the, the key idea here is we want to calculate both group generate and propagate to avoid uh, waiting for a ripple to be determined. Or rather to determine if uh, the group generates a carry. Okay. So we can take a little example, uh, look at this. This is another one of these PG diagrams. Again, again, just to be clear, this is the delay of the PG cell. Delay is on the Y axis here. Uh, and now we have the delay of a groupwise propagate generate higher valency cell here. Okay, um, so just to be just just as an example here, so we're saying that output C out K 
is equal to GK plus PK and GK minus one plus PK minus one and blah, 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 or P1 and G0 or P0, C0. So basically all what we're doing is computing um, this uh, recursive formula um, in order to compute the output of this higher valency cell all in parallel right off the bat, okay? So this doesn't actually help us a whole lot for that first stage, but it definitely help us for the latter stages where we've pre-computed this generate propagate and we're just waiting for the output of one of these bits uh, to indicate what's, go what's going on in the previous stage. Okay, so the total propagation delay of this sort of structure is TPG plus the delay of one of these higher valency cells plus N minus one plus K minus one times the and or delay plus the XOR delay. Okay, so again, it's going to be hard to truly understand this just by very briefly looking at it as we're doing right now. Uh, again, I do highly recommend that you take a look at the textbook to try and understand this a little bit better. Now, if we can look ahead across groups of bits, then presumably we could start to look ahead over our look ahead results, okay? So this is uh, uh, basically what we end up calling a tree adder, which is gets much more complicated in the PG diagram and so on. But basically what we're trying to do is, is pre-compute as much of this stuff in parallel as possible, you know, pre-compute all these different possible outcomes of propagates and generates. And then at the end of the day, we don't have to wait for this long ripple to carry through the chain. We've kind of already pre-computed a bunch of different outputs and we just select the one that happens to be correct. So the Kogi stone adder is one possible um, implementation of this. Um, there are many possible different tree adders that one can look at. This one happens to be uh, particularly fast uh, because it has a lot of um, look ahead computation. It also has a reasonable fan in for the cells that uh, is implemented with it. So this is actually a very nice uh, possible way to do this. So, so far we've only looked at adders uh, and we've dabbled into, sub into subtractors as well, but hold on to your horses. This is not the end. We also have to build other blocks such as multipliers. Uh, we're not actually gonna get into dividers in this class. So let's just stick with multipliers. So it turns out implementing multipliers sounds scary. Adders were complicated enough. Multipliers should be extremely complicated. And if you want to get really, really fast multipliers, then yeah, uh, you can get extremely complicated. But it turns out that for various reasons, there's a little bit more restrictions going on here when we build uh, multipliers. Um, and this uh, simplifies the, the base implementation to something that we can actually fairly readily grasp. So let's just go through a, as, as we did for the adder case, a simple Boolean representation of a multiplier. All right, so when we have a multiplier, uh, we have a multiplicand and a multiplier, right? And so we multiply the two together and get an outcome. So it turns out that how we do this in Boolean is exactly how one would do it in grade school arithmetic. Okay, so first we start by looking at the LSB of the multiplier. In this case, it is logic one. And we multiply that by the multiplicand, which is basically code word for anding it with the multiplicand, okay? So if we and it, then we basically just get a representation of the exact same bits uh, in the multiplicand written down here, okay? Now, uh, when we then go ahead and move to LSB plus one, uh, it turns out in this particular example, it's another logic one. But then we write down the uh, partial product shifted over by one uh, location, right? So now we, we write down the same multiplicand information, but now we're shifted by one. Then we do this again. In this case, the LSB plus two is a zero. So the output is just a bunch of zeros. And then the MSB now is just uh, another logic one. Uh, so we go zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Okay, so now we have all these partial products. What we have to do now is um, 
add them all up. Okay, so in this case, zero plus nothing is just equal to zero. One plus zero is just equal to one. Zero plus one plus zero is equal to one. One plus zero plus zero plus zero is again equal to one. Zero plus one plus zero plus one is equal to one zero or zero in a carry. Okay. One plus one plus three zeros is equal to zero plus a carry. One plus one plus zero plus one is equal to one with a carry. And that's one and one. Okay, so this is what we call the result. Now, if you convert to this Boolean or this binary representation into base 10, you'll find the answer is equal to 462, uh, which validates that we have indeed done this computation correctly. So it turns out that the things that we learned in, in grade school arithmetic are, well, exactly the tools that we need to use in order to build multipliers in Boolean algebra. So this is kind of the general uh, form of this. Uh, the multiplicand is uh, given by a vector y of multi-bits. The multiplier is given by a vector x of multiple bits. Uh, the length of x and y do not necessarily have to be the same. Uh, and then we create a bunch of partial products and then add them up. And that is the result or the product, if you will. Okay. So the idea here is in order to build a multiplier, you basically just need a bunch of adders and you need a way to do this multiplication function in the first place, okay? So it turns out that when we build these sort of structures, we like to represent them with what we call a dot diagram. A dot diagram looks something like this. Each dot represents uh, an individual partial product, and then we just have to do column-wise addition of all of these partial products in order to get a result. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at a fairly simple uh, example here. So in this case, we have uh, X as an input and Y as an input, and we wanna multiply them together. X is a four bit input and Y is also a four bit input. So this is a four by four multiplier, okay? So this multiplication function, this bitwise multiplication function, if you will, is really just an AND gate. Uh, so this is why we have, uh, in this case, y0 being anded with x0, x1, x2, and x3 uh, in order to create uh, these individual, uh, or this kind of first row of the uh, partial product table, if you will. Uh, and then we take y0, y1 and we multiply it bitwise by x0, x1, x2, x3, et cetera, in order to create the second row in our partial product uh, list. Okay, and now we have to start adding things. Okay, and so what we do is we basically take the, for example, the output of this cell with the output of this cell and pass it through a full adder with the carry in coming from the previous stage, the carry out going to the next stage, the sum going to the next row. Okay, something like this. All right, um, and then this just kind of propagates through the rest of the array, right? So this is uh, quite um, actually straightforward. This is not too complicated if you think about it. All right, so let me just uh, highlight the output bits and this annotation I will keep. I won't erase this part. Uh, so these here are the output bits. Okay. Now you'll notice some, some weird things here. You know, some of these are full adders and some of these, these are half adders. How can we get away with using half adders? That's weird. Uh, so it turns out that this is legitimate. We can use half adders when possible. And it's only possible when we don't have a carry in. Okay. Uh, and in the first row uh, of the, or the first column of these partial products, we don't have a carry in because there's no preceding stage happening in that dot diagram. Okay, so, so we can use the occasional half adder here, but only really on the peripheries when there's no carry in. All right, um, but other than that, this is exactly analogous or like our hand calculation. This is just a schematic depiction of doing that calculation by hand, but in this case using Boolean logic. So the next question that, that comes to mind is, 
what is the critical path here? Okay, so it turns out that this is a little bit harder to um, model in the sense that there are many possible paths going through this adder. Uh, so for example, one critical path is you go through this half adder and then full and then half, full, half, 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 blah, 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 blah all the way to the output here. Okay, so that is definitely a possible critical path. Another possible path is that we go this way. Okay, it turns out that either of these approaches ends up having roughly the same kind of delay. Now there's a little bit of a difference with the number of half adders versus full adders and, and, and so on, uh, but they have roughly the same delay. Okay, um, the, the delay through this is summarized with the formula at the bottom. So this, as it turns out, makes optimizing a, the delay through adder structures more difficult. Okay, so if a, if a structure has multiple critical paths, we must optimize all of the paths. Otherwise, we'll be left with one path that's longer than all the others, and that effectively becomes our critical path. Okay, um, so in that particular case, we don't have a whole lot we can do. We basically just need to let, uh, you know, there, there's just not much we can we can do to optimize these various paths. So in this case, the critical path passes through both the C out and the sum. So this is very different from the adders where we, we were highly interested in, in optimizing the delay to C out. For a multiplier, because the critical path goes through both C out and sum, those optimizations that we learned in the prior adder portion of this of these lectures no longer applies to multipliers. Okay, so generally we want to set the delay of the uh, sum to be roughly equal to the delay of the carryout path for optimum speed. But there are things that we can do. Uh, including carry save and tree multiplier topologies and so on in order to save speed. Um, those, however, are outside of the scope of this course, uh, and so we won't be discussing them any further. So of course it turns out that adders and multipliers are not the only useful logic elements that we need when we're creating arithmetic logic units. Uh, there are other data path logic units that uh, might be of interest that we may want to implement using different approaches than our normal adder and multiplier structures. So example, we may want to build a zeros detector or a ones detector, you know, determine if the data we're looking at is composed of all zeros or all ones. That's certainly something we may want to do. Equality detectors are also things that we typically want to be able to have in our microprocessors. Is A equal to B? Uh, or magnitude comparators, is A less than B or greater than B or greater or than or equal to B and so on, right? Um, so these are some of the other data path logics uh, that we may want to consider trying to build. So it turns out that building a ones detector is rather easy. Um, basically, all we have to do is and all of the inputs together. And if all of the inputs are one, then the output of a giant and gate will also be equal to one. Now we can do the same thing uh, with a zeros detector, basically just invert all of the inputs and then uh, compare them all to um, together. Uh, to create a logic one. So it turns out that there's two interesting ways to do this um, kind of computation. There's there's this way and there's this way. Okay, so we can kind of do all of these in a um, kind of a tree-like structure, if you will, using the, t the top approach um, or, or the other approach on the bottom here. Okay, so the benefit of the approach on the bottom, let me just maybe perhaps write a note here, is that this is useful Uh, if you know that the MSB arrives last. So for example, perhaps this is the, the output of an adder. Um, I suppose I should write outer adder output. Okay, so this is why when we had our earlier lectures on input ordering, we said, you know, sometimes we know that this output or this input is likely to arrive last, 
now that we've studied how adders work, we now know that the MSBs at the output, at least in the worst case on the critical path delay, will arrive last. Okay, um, that's why we spent some time talking about input ordering, talking about normal logic design. Okay, now in this particular case, we can further take advantage of that. We know that the MSB will be coming last, and so why don't we pre-compute the result of this ones detector uh, for the LSBs first, and then as soon as this very last MSB comes in, all it has to do is go through one AND gate, and boom, we're done. Okay, so that's a very nice way to, to exploit uh, the um, behavior of the output of adders in order to simplify the computation of downstream blocks, as just simply one example. We can build an equality detector pretty easily. Basically, all we do is XOR the inputs uh, between the two vectors. So if A, X, A0, XOR B0 is 1, and A1, XOR B1 is 1, and so on and so forth, then we know that both A and B will be equal together, and that's a very simple way to build uh, an equality detector. There's other arithmetic uh, operations that we may want to do. Uh, we have shifts. Uh, you know, if you remember to your assembly code, uh, shifts are things that uh, we might be interested in doing. There's things like logical shifts. Um, so we can shift a number to the left, uh, LSL, or shift a logic number to the right. And when we do so, if there happens to be some, you know, um, um, <clears throat> bits that, that fall out, uh, we'll replace them with zeros. Likewise, we have arithmetic shifts, so we can shift left or right, and we do sign extension if we shift them. So this is used for two's complement. Uh, and rotate operations are when we just shift numbers left and right, and uh, you know the bits that shift out on one side basically just fill into the next side. So we're rotating the the whole logic structure over here. Now it turns out that these can get complicated depending on how you want to build them. So one way to do this is with what we call a binary shifter. Uh, and so basically what we have is we have some control uh, signals here. So these are your control pins. And then basically for, for each bit, we have a MUX. Uh, this is built using pass transistor logic, NMOS only. Uh, you'd probably in practice want to build with, with this with transmission gates. Although, as you can imagine, uh, or perhaps shortly, uh, you will be able to see that this gets very complicated very quickly. But basically, if we have a no-op controlling the signal here, um, so this transistor becomes active, and AI simply goes through to BI, uh, and life is good. Okay. Now, if shift right is enabled, then we say, well, let's take AI plus 1 and shift it in through the output to BI. Uh, or... If left is enabled, we'll take AI minus one and shift that through to BI here. Okay, so it's just a simple way to get either the current bit through, the previous bit, or the next bit out to, to, to the output. Okay, so in other words, this MUX is selecting, is are we selecting the previous bit, the current bit, or the next bit. Okay, so as you can imagine, if you want to be able to shift, say, a 64-bit word uh, all the way up to 64 times, then you need a 64 times size, uh, 64 to 1 mux, and you need 64 of these. Okay, so that's a large number of transistors simply be doing a, a shift. All right, um, in particular, 64 uh, transistors like that, we probably want to make sure that we have, um, you know, the, the right set of logic here to make sure we don't have any weird VT shifts and, you know, logic levels are fine and so on. So sometimes what we prefer to use is, is something called a barrel shifter. Uh, again, we have some, some control words here. Um, and basically, this is just uh, more of a, an arrayed based uh, way of doing this where we take, for example, A0, 
and we can shift A0 into B0, B1, B2, or B3, depending on the status of these control bits. In this particular case, we get, you know, there's just wires going everywhere, and as these things grow and grow, you know, for example, a 16-bit shifter, uh, the number of wires here get extremely complicated. So shifters, albeit are conceptually easy to understand, turn out to be, you know, you have to be careful about how you design these at the uh, transistor level.